Every day, KBR carries out vital government missions around the world and above it. From designing realistic virtual training environments and advanced simulations, from systems engineering, integration, and test support for national defense, to real-time readiness and logistical support in regions of national interest, to construction and improvements on military installations. KBR keeps the critical machinery of the world moving forward. Our ground crews keep planes in the air and essential supplies on the move. Our flight instructors train some of the top pilots in the world. Our technicians provide telemetry and tracking for satellites in orbit. Our analysts coordinate weather data for accurate forecasts and climate studies. Our experts work tirelessly to improve all aspects of spaceflight, from launch to downrange support. On the ground, at sea, in the air, and in space. Every day, all day, people count on KBR for high-impact, mission-critical results. We are the future, designed and delivered, and you won't believe what we do tomorrow. Please welcome John Doyen, IMSA Executive Vice President. Good afternoon, and welcome to Breakout 6, National Security and Climate Change, Managing the Risk. This is the first time we explore this topic at the summit and have a terrific lineup of speakers for you this afternoon who will discuss the impacts of climate change and how it affects global stability, military readiness, and the risk of war. And now, I'm pleased to welcome Ella Studer, Senior Vice President for Government Solutions at KBR, who will introduce our moderator. Over to you, Ella. Thank you so much for the very warm welcome. And I'd like to thank INSA and AFCEA for their leadership in the community. KBR has been a proud sponsor of INSA and AFCEA for many years. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Human migration, political upheaval, water and food insecurity, these are some of the key challenges related to climate change captured in the National Intelligence Council Global Trend 2035 report and addressed in DNI's 2019 Worldwide Threat Briefing to Congress. Our panel brings together experts to discuss the impacts of these challenges on national security and what can be done to manage the risk. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's session, Professor Greg Tremington. Professor of the Practice of International Relations and Spatial Sciences at the University of Southern California. Professor Tremington served as chairman of the National Intelligence Council from September 2014 to January 2017. Earlier, he directed the RAND Corporation's Center for Global Risk and Security, and before that, the Intelligence Policy Center and its International Security and Defense Policy Center. He has served in government on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and Vice Chair of the National Intelligence Council, overseeing the writing of America's National Intelligence Estimate. Please welcome Professor Trevington. It's a great pleasure to uh, be on this panel and to be with INSANAFSIA. It's a real tribute, I think, to the organizations that they have chosen to have a panel on national security and climate change. Unfortunately, we have learned that there really now are only two existential threats out there. One is pandemics and the other is climate change. In some ways, sadly, pandemics is even easier than climate change because with people dying all around us, it's hard not to do something, hard not to act. By contrast, climate change is out there. We don't see our fellow Americans falling dead day by day, but it's very much out there and it is the existential threat of our time. So it's a great tribute, I think, to the organizations and to national security to have this conversation. I hope we do learn something relevant to climate change from the pandemic, which uh, I think qualifies, at least in my judgment, as in terms of needless loss of life, the greatest government failure in the history of the American Republic. I hope we can do better with climate change. Let me say a word about of introduction to each of the distinguished panelists, and then we'll jump right in. The Honorable Sherry Goodman is a senior strategist and center for, at the Center for Climate and Security, as well as a member of its advisory board. She's had lots of distinguished positions inside and outside government. She was relevant to this conversation, the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security. 
the Honorable John Conger is director of the Center for Climate and Security and a senior U.S. advisor to the International Military Council on Climate and Security. He was previously a principal undersecretary of defense and the comptroller. Aaron Sikorsky is deputy director of the Strategic Futures Group at my old home, the National Intelligence Council, where she leads the global trends effort, the next once every four years effort to look into the future, and is its environmental security and analyst. Rear Admiral David Titley is Professor Emeritus, I think, at Penn State University, as well as Director at Center for Solutions to Weather and Climate Risk. He previously served as oceanographer and navigator of the Navy and led the U.S. Navy's Task Force on Climate Change in 2009. I want to say one word of commercial about the intelligence community and the NIC in particular, who have been on to the climate change issue for a long, long time. Congress has not always been pleased with uh, us for doing that, and perhaps some administrations not either, but it's been important work and it's been very good work for now about 20 years. I particularly like to salute uh, Rich Engel, Major General Rich Engel, who started working on climate security, I think about 20 years ago, and wrote a seminal Nick paper on the winners and losers looking geopolitically from climate change. So it's been an issue that's been on at least the National Intelligence Council's mind. And I've been impressed in my conversations with other government officials, officials in our government, at how much of people at places like AID look to the intelligence community, the NIC in particular, for work on climate, water, food. I remember sharing a panel with the AID administrator a couple of years ago when I was in the government, and I had looked quickly at a paper that the NIC had done on water security several years before I became chair. Uh, he knew it chapter and verse. It was had the benefit of being unclassified, but with the imprimatur of the intelligence community, something he could easily use with his colleagues, both inside the United States and abroad. Let me start with Erin, since she's now on the working at the coalface. Uh, and let me ask you, Erin, from your perspective, sitting at the NIC, how do you think about your work on climate and national security? Thanks, Greg. That's an excellent question. And thanks to INSA for the invitation to be part of this panel today. You know, as you noted, Greg, the intelligence community has warned of the security risks related to climate and environment for many years. When I was preparing for today, I went back, I found a speech from DCI George Tennant in 1996, a public talk where he warned of environment and climate risk. And every one of the seven Global Trends reports has mentioned food, water, energy resources, and climate as a key factor shaping these risks. In our next report, which is due in January 2021, which as Greg noted, it's a quadrennial report, completely unclassified, looks out about two decades at key risks and uncertainties shaping the national security environment. That report will talk about environment and climate risks as one of four structural drivers shaping the future national security landscape. We are looking at these as what we call fundamentals, more forecastable trends rooted in data, trajectories we judge we can assess with more confidence. And what I wanted to talk about briefly was in the report, we discussed two primary pathways by which climate risks impact US national security. And I know my fellow panelists will dig into these more deeply with their expertise as we go today. But the first is the direct impact, right? The physical effects, rising temperatures, more extreme weather, melting sea ice, rising sea levels. These already threaten US national security interests at home and abroad. No country is immune, but the near-term effects disproportionately fall in the developing world. The second pathway, and frankly, what I think is the more interesting pathway for uh, intelligence analysts is the indirect pathway, where you have exacerbating or compounding effects on other risks. We have cascading shocks that are going to strain even highly developed countries during the next few decades as governments struggle to gather the resources they need. And I think this pathway really benefits from the use of examples. I want to talk a little bit about East Africa, which is a region I'm fairly familiar with. And just looking at it in the year 2020, it began the year with 21 million people already food insecure. They've experienced climate change related flooding, one of the worst locust plagues in 70 years. Then on top of that, you add the pandemic. This is a region rife with ethnic conflict, uh, non-state actors, terrorist groups that are looking to undermine governments. 
As the head of the World Food Program for the region noted, it's shock upon shock upon shock. And that East Africa is not alone in the world of regions that will be facing these kind of threats over the next 20 years, and climate plays a huge role in that. I think for us in the intelligence community, it's critical we're precise, detailed, and we acknowledge the interdependence of the world we're analyzing, because very rarely is a climate issue the sole driver behind a security threat. It's the intersection of climate with other developments and with other trends and issues that combine to increase the risks. And I'll just end on this question. I, we've got three principles I think we in the intelligence community need to keep in mind as we evaluate these risks. The first is that we need to leverage the expertise across the US government. There is so much uh, work being done in a variety of agencies on the science and modeling of climate risks. And we in the intelligence community need, need to make sure we understand where to find that information how to understand it and leverage it in our work. The second principle to keep in mind is to make sure that we're using the right metrics and measures to understand risks in other countries. And what I'm talking about here is when we rack and stack other countries' abilities to manage climate risk, we need to make sure we're looking beyond just measures of material power, which is a traditional way intelligence analysts like to look at the world, right? But instead, we need to do what the most recent Global Trends Report in uh, uh, 2016 talked about resilience. How do we understand measuring resilience in other countries? And as we've seen with the pandemic, that it's not always material power that matters, but there are tangible and intangible things related to ad adaptability, flexibility, the ability to absorb shocks. And it's those intangibles like trust, societal cohesion, history, that I think will make all the difference for understanding which countries are better positioned to manage climate risks going forward. And so we in the intelligence community need to understand and think about that. The final thing I'll say is we need to also maintain a principle of understanding and communicating uncertainty. And not just uncertainty around the physical science, which there is some, but the uncertainties around how humans react to these changes, right? How do states and societies respond to the climate risks they face? Because that's where policymakers need to understand the decision points they have going forward uh, on, on these risks. So, I mean, we could all talk about these issues forever. I've probably already taken too much time, but that gives you a framework for how we're thinking about these issues on the NIC. Great, thanks a lot. Let me just ask one follow-up. One of the things that strikes me about both pandemic and climate change is most of the expertise is out there in society, not inside the government and not, not inside the intelligence community. If you look at the pandemic, as far as I can tell, the first warning of real trouble in China came from a private group, an NGO, ProMed, at the end of December last year. How are the links between you on the inside and those important outsiders, both outside the intelligence community, but also outside the government? Is that relationship getting better and better? Well, as, as you know well know, Greg, from your time on the NIC, that is one of the key roles the National Intelligence Council plays within the intelligence community is to provide that link between academia, the private sector, uh, think tanks, and the government. And we do a lot of that with the Global Trends Project, and we've done it on climate issues. Um, that's, you know, I know John and, and Sherry from that work quite well. Uh, we do it on, on other issues as well to make sure that we, we're getting all that information and then synthesizing it and providing it to policymakers through our all source analysis. Great, great. Sherry, if I can go next to you, uh, would you step back and take a kind of strategic perspective and how do you think about climate change and national security from your variety of roles taking a more strategic perspective? Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, and let me thank you uh, and uh, INSA and the many leaders in the intelligence and national security community, both in the public sector and the private sector, uh, for your work in this area. I think it's one where you will find yourselves uh, spending increasing time um, in coming years as climate change is now among the top global risks that we face. Let me also thank my fellow panelists who have uh, been in this field with me for quite some time. And uh, one you called out there, Greg, uh, Rich Engel, who has uh, also one of my uh, favorites. We worked together when I was in DOD in the 90s and uh, he was commander at Edwards Air Force Base as a major general. Uh, but then since he joined the NIC, 
uh, his leadership there on a variety of national intelligence estimates on climate change, water, food security, energy security, uh, have all g given you all in the intelligence community a strong foundation on which to build. And I have had the privilege of working with many of you in this field um, over my quarter century working in this area. And so, um, you know, 13 years ago, we formed the first military advisory board on climate change and national security, which uh, then Admiral Dave Titley was oceanographer of the Navy and uh, briefed the group of three and four stars. Uh, most of whom were the combatant commanders of the various services recently retired um, and uh, senior and senior leaders. And it was that recognition that climate change is a threat multiplier uh, that has led to the work Rich Engel and others have done over the last almost decade and a half now into the inclusion in the national defense strategy, national military strategy, and also the president's national security strategy even stretching back further the recognition recognition of environmental degradation, but also the security implications of climate change uh, as among our more significant risks. So um, where are we today? Well, you know, the, the fact that you're holding this panel is recognition that it's become higher on the agenda. You know, we've had recently strong statements both in um, the Global Trends Report, in the Worldwide Threat Assessment, uh, Dan Coates and others significantly emphasized that climate change is now a global known. It's not a variable, okay? And um, no region of the world is immune. Um, and the U.S. security and institutional interests are particularly vulnerable. Um, and in fact, what, what we find ourselves in now is that we're better prepared in some ways in, in, in the intelligence and defense community for other security risks compared to the climate risk because it's not one that we solely own. It's often thought of, well, it's, you know, some other community is concerned with it. But in fact, as Aaron so eloquently stated, it really affects all the other security threats. Uh, and as we see the collision of COVID and climate today, um, the converging risks that are affecting the least, you know, the most vulnerable among us, both within our own country and overseas, we see how that happens with the West on fire, rampant flooding in the Midwest, and hurricanes um, trouncing and trashing much of the South and Gulf Coast. We see that, uh, as Aaron noted, those who can survive those extreme risks most are the ones that are more resilient. But how we measure and manage that is going to become increasingly important in future years. And that's where I think you know the work that you all do in the intelligence community to help build these tools, not only for, in, you know, you'll be building tools both for the intel community, but also for citizens at every level to be able to measure and manage uh, their own risk. And that comes in the form of increasing uh, prediction, um, uh, predictive capabilities, and the technology to help us understand those near sort of seasonal, sub-seasonal changes that are occurring. So let's just take one region that I think is the most vulnerable, one of the more vulnerable besides East Africa, but a different kind of region, which is the Arctic, uh, a whole new ocean that has opened in our lifetime, really. Now in the next 10 years, uh, 10 to 20 years is going to be ice free for long stretches with Russia trying to monetize the Northern Sea Route and build a toll road from Europe um, to Asia for shipping with China declaring itself a near Arctic stakeholder. All of this because the sea ice is retreating, the permafrost is collapsing, uh, and temperatures are rising um, at an unbelievable rate, twice you know what we find in the rest of the planet, sometimes even more so. Uh, so what's happening is that these changes are occurring at a rate beyond which humans can reasonably adapt, particularly with our infrastructure. So let me emphasize, I think this is going to be another area where metrics and uh, management is going to be increasingly important because I think we don't yet know how to predict well the collapse of infrastructure built, for example, for the permafrost. And Russia has now found, learning the hard way, that uh, much of its Arctic infrastructure for energy and mining is at risk. 
okay, which could pose global, you know, threats, regional threats from spills that are occurring in that region at the Norilsk uh, Mining Center or beyond that. And uh, so I think that's going to be increasingly important. Another climate risk, another climate threat multiplier that I think we've under evaluated to this point is extreme heat. Uh, you know, now we're going to find that many parts of South Asia, Middle East, uh, in coming decades, India, uh, are going to be uninhabitable without reliable air conditioning, and many millions will not have that. Uh, and so I think that there are going to be growing need to understand the impacts of extreme heat and then mitigate um, those causes. There's quite a bit more I could um, talk about, but I think I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, uh, John and Dave, and then look forward to engaging in the discussion with all of you. Great. I can't resist one slightly bureaucratic question. When you were standing up environmental security at the Pentagon, were you surprised where you found either enemies or allies or both? Oh, great question, Greg. Well, uh, first of all, people were skeptical uh, in the early 90s of what was environmental security. So there was that. Um, and uh, people certainly uh, didn't want their budgets taken. You know, that's the bureaucratic thing. But a strategy without budget is hallucination. So the first thing I had to do was figure out where the budget was uh, and how to influence it. Uh, and, and once I got my arms around that, um, you know, I learned that even at the highest level, the senior levels uh, of the military, they could be persuaded and they wanted actually to improve environmental conditions for troops and families. So where you start with readiness, how it impacts re military readiness, then I think you're in a good place. And we have found as we've, you know, as, as the uh, concerns have moved from environment to climate, and as John Conger knows well, when uh, our installations are affected or our troops are training, uh, protecting their readiness is always paramount. Right, great, great. Maybe that's a good segue into you, Dave. Would you take a somewhat more operational perspective, perhaps, and give us your sense for how national security is affected by climate when it comes to military operations in particular. Yeah, so thanks very much and, and thanks for having me. And this, I'll do the classic DC thing of thanks for the question and now I'll talk about whatever, whatever I want to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, which is what we all do anyways. So, so here's the thing. So I'm kind of the token physical scientist on this uh, panel here. I've got a PhD in meteorology, all that sort of thing. Uh, and one of the things, since this is really an Intel uh, function, is I think it's useful for, for the Intel analysts to sort of understand like, you know, why are these scientists like so confident? Because we know in the Intel community, and I used to be the Assistant Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare, so the Office of Naval Intelligence reported to me, uh, you know, it's really hard to predict the future, right? I mean, we know that, That's it's extremely hard. We have extremely smart people working on it. And we, you know, and it's it's hard. So why do these you know, scientists waltz in here and think they can tell you what the world's gonna be like in 50 or 75 or 100 years when we're struggling to try to get it right in 10 to 20? And the reason is, is kind of simply it's, it's physics. So I tell people in my public talks that this is, you know, at the fundamentals of climate, this is cutting edge 19th century science. We've known the basics for about 150 years and the incentives in the physical science and academic communities, all the incentives are for actually is for somebody to overturn this based on evidence. You would be famous for centuries, if not millennia. Uh, and the more and more and more that we have studied this, really since the 19th century, the more and more we understand the very basics that everybody has talked about that the reason we are warming is because of the greenhouse gases and we keep putting more and more of them into the atmosphere. So, so we have, uh, I mean, I could go on and on, I won't on this, but there is very, very, very high confidence relative to many things that the intelligence community has to deal with. And that's because we're dealing with physics and not people. Now, the people, and Aaron's already touched on this, the people's reactions to this are much more harder to figure out. And also, if you're listening to a climate scientist, you should understand that broad sort of continental and regional predictions, especially on temperature, have 
much higher confidence in some other things like what is northern China going to look like in the year 2060 to 2065? That's a much harder question than how how is the earth going to warm up over the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, so so with caveats, there's in general pretty high confidence. Now to your question, Greg, you know, I look at this in the strategic sense of people, water and change, and Sherry has really addressed a lot of that. When I was starting Task Force Climate Change in about 2009 at the direction of uh, then Chief of Naval Operations, Gary Roughhead, uh, I talked about this really as a readiness issue. This is at the tactical and operational level. You know, in the Pentagon, we plan for all kinds of contingencies and, you know, it goes back to Sun Tzu, right? Know the weather, know the terrain. Uh, climate is really just that longer term terrain of what you're going to fight in. So whether it's the Arctic and how that Arctic is changing, and I can tell this uh, audience that the reason the Navy started Task Force Climate Change was because of the changes in the Arctic. And I told the Navy leadership that that was simply the harbinger of many, many more changes to come, and they accepted that argument. Uh, but it's more than just the Arctic. Uh, there has been some nice PhD work on the limitations of combat and uh, transport military aircraft in a changing environment. So it gets down into sort of technical things like uh, density altitudes and pressure altitudes and stuff that you know people's eyes start rolling to the back of their head. But it's really, really important if you have a fully loaded combat uh, C-130 coming into a very short landing strip you better understand, you know, how quickly can you build up combat power? So I'm not talking about hugging trees and saving whales. I'm talking about combat power, and that in the Pentagon is is pretty interesting. John uh, had a front row seat in all the infrastructure issues, uh, and you know, we of course, you know, we played the away game, right? So you can't play the away game unless you can build your team, and we build our team at home, and we build it with our training ranges and our bases. And if those bases are under threats for a variety of reasons, whether it's sea level rise or others, we've got an issue and we have to deal with it. And finally, you know, that uh, the impacts, those impacts on societies, I would absolutely agree of, you know, some of the things already Aaron and Sherry have talked about with health. I would add that the refugees and migration, whether it's forced or unplanned, is a huge issue because by and large, people aren't going to sit in one place and just die. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that's true. So those with means uh, will move. And we saw this with Syria, right? About a million roughly, give or take refugees, you know, nearly toppled the European Union, uh, or at least they severely shook it. So you look at the numbers of potential climate refugees in the decades ahead, and they are in the, you know, potentially hundreds of millions. Uh, Will all of that affect the U.S.? Probably not all of it. But then who thought that refugees coming out of Syria would create some of the geopolitical changes that we've we've seen? So we need to be ready for that. We need to realize that health and and migration are two of the biggest effects. And I'll just close with, again, as a physical scientist, I, I've talked to many, many very smart people working, you know, all the intricacies of climate from a a climatologist or a meteorologist perspective, I can't sometimes remind them of uh, George Clemenceau's quote that war is too important to be left to the generals. Uh, climate is too important to be left to the physical scientists. So I'm very, very happy to see social scientists, intelligence analysts, and policymakers involved in this because they are the ones that are going to not only have solutions, but be able to sell them to the most senior leadership and and actually do something about this. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, now to you, uh, John, to bat cleanup. Uh, lots of things have been said, but lots of things haven't been said. Perhaps you could uh, play off at the beginning uh, Dave's invitation to talk more about the homeland side of this, uh, infrastructure, those issues. Um, how does it, what does it mean for military bases and basing? But also you've had uh, interesting congressional experience, so uh, you might want to give us that perspective as well. Sure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, being able to talk to this audience. I don't often get the opportunity to talk to the intelligence community, so this is a this is a neat perspective. Let me give you a couple of thoughts as to why 
you know, I often get asked why the military would even care about climate change in the first place. And, and, I, and I have a, a sort of a standard three category answer. My three category answer is uh, because it affects your mission today. That's your installations. That's your readiness. That's today's operations because climate change is definitely affecting all of those pieces, whether it's through sea level rise or the wildfires out west or hurricanes that seem to stop and just keep dropping rain. Uh, and you get at Keesler Air Force Base, whether it's 20 inches or 30 inches, that's going to cause uh, some some damage. Um, we saw that. Uh, I think the wake up call for some of these direct impacts was a couple years back when we got a hurricane that flattened Tyndall Air Force Base. We got a hurricane at Camp Lejeune that dropped 25 inches of rain. And then a couple months later, we had record floods of the Missouri River that took out a third of uh, off at Air Force Base. And you add those three things together, and it was about $10 billion of damage. When you start talking about numbers on that scale, then you're talking about real money. Then the leadership pays attention. Then Congress pays attention. And, and it starts to wake people up that, oh, oh there's a bill. Um, and, and fundamentally, uh, in Washington, D.C., money is the lifeblood. And so when things start to cost money, that's an issue. Frankly, a lot of the politics around climate change is driven by the fact that people didn't want to pay money. They didn't want to put their money at risk by admitting that this was a, a challenge. And, and so that drove a lot of the politics. Um, you know, uh, I'll do a, a tangent here to, to one of Dave's comments when he's talking about the scientists having these conversations and whether the science is settled. I am not a climate scientist. But, you know, when 99 percent of your climate scientists say something is true, you just sort of accept it and move on. And you have to avoid having science debates between non-scientists. Fundamentally, it's like, um, you know, I believe the doctors when they tell me cigarettes cause cancer. Uh, I'm not going to pull out a chart I found in some obscure document saying, look, the, they've all been lying. Um, you know, and fundamentally, those are generally funded by the tobacco industry anyway. So anyway, let's set that aside. So there's one, direct direct uh, operations. Second um, it is sort of the category of things where it's new missions that you're going to have to do, whether it's n more humanitarian assistance, whether it's the whole new ocean that Sherry referenced in the Arctic. Um, that those kinds of things. And then there's the threat multiplier dynamics that, that uh, have already been discussed at length. But as you start to look around the world and you see these climate stresses and instability, uh, you cannot help but take climate change into account. When you're looking at, it's, it's not an or problem anymore, right? It's not, uh, you know, is climate change a bigger threat than China, which is one of those politics, you know, congressmen will ask that question. Why am I thinking about this, you know? Um, well, the answer is that climate change affects all of those things. It's not, is climate change a bigger threat than Russia or China? It's how does climate change influence the threat from Russia and China? How does climate change affect Russian behavior in the Arctic? How does it affect Chinese behavior to, to take over and dominate water resources in Asia? How does it affect how they uh, hold those water resources over their neighbors, whether it be in India or Vietnam or whatever? Those dynamics are all relevant. So as we start to think about the politics of all of this, and we know that there's politics, but if you look at Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill is has accepted that climate change is, is real. They have accepted that now we're having a debate over what to do about it, and some people don't want to do anything about it, and that is what it is. That's a different political conversation. But the security implications have been broadly accepted. You have uh, folks like Senator Inhofe, who's the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, who's a famous climate skeptic. But he has been quoted, and he was quoted before he became chairman, as saying, I, I, this is not my most important issue, but if it helps the military, I'm not going to say no to, to getting more resilient. And so I accept that as a win, in all honesty, and being able to address these issues. Last thought, and I'll get off the stage. There was a lot of attention, uh, sort of both political and internal attention, given to the fact that the national defense strategy didn't talk about climate change. Um, as you look at it and as you read it, climate change is everywhere between the lines in that document. It's just not, it's just not stated. When you talk about great power competition, how can you not talk about the Arctic when you're talking about Russia? There, were, there was testimony a couple years back where we had to change operational plans in Europe, uh, you know, posturing towards Russia because Russia was moving all their forces to exert influence over the, over the Arctic regions. So, those dynamics, how do you not take that into account? So great power competition, 
certainly Russia and China are being influenced by climate change, so we should be taking that into account. It says homeland, the homeland is not a, no longer a sanctuary. You look at all those bases that get hit. Um, and, you know, whether, whether it's through, you know, people worry about cyber attacks, and you should. Um, but Mother Nature has done more damage to U.S. military bases in the last five years than cyber attacks have. And cyber attacks haven't leveled any of the bases that I can think of, but, <clears throat> you know, Mother Nature sure has. So, so thinking about that is, is relevant. And then uh, I guess the last thing I'll, I'll leave the stage with is you got to think about partners and allies. Partners and allies all think this is a real issue. And when you tell them you don't think it's a real issue, that affects your relationship with them. And when China walks up and says, well, I care about this, even if the U.S. doesn't, come and partner with me on Project X, Y, or Z, they gain influence. And it changes the dynamics around the world. And that's something we have to pay attention to. Once again, going back to great power competition. So you can say the national defense strategy doesn't say climate change, but it's everywhere in there. So I'll get off the stage with that. It's a great point. Let me just follow up on one on one issue. Uh, it's probably a little unfair to talk about Mother Nature, right? Since we are at base, it's human activity that's causing a lot of or exacerbating these problems. Now, it looks like Mother Nature, but it's in fact us in the end that's doing it. I had a question about about bases and facilities. You no noted the cost; those big ticket items done. Uh, Mother Nature, again in quotation marks, has done more to affect bases than cyber attacks. <clears throat> I think I know the answer, but the question is, uh, as you look at low-lying facilities in California, Hawaii, Guam, Japan, uh, the question is, how, how much is it going to cost to recreate, or will it be possible to recreate those facilities? So so it's, it's not a simple question. Uh, we have about a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure inside the defense enterprise. Um, you know, not all those things are going to have to be recreated. I got asked once if, uh, you know, was were we planning on moving Norfolk? And the answer, it's a dumb question. I, mean, it's, I didn't tell them that. But, but, but I mean, you know, 100 years ago, we didn't have half the bases we're going to have. If the real threat to Norfolk comes in 100 years because there's going to be three feet of sea level rise and half and a good portion of the infrastructure is not going to be viable there, I don't know what my requirements are going to be in 100 years. I don't know what I'm going to need to replace. And so let's let's not worry about that just yet. You, I think you want to worry about resiliency in the next 10, 20 years before you start worrying about replacing everything or moving everything. Um, it's it's a uh, let's not overreact. This is going to be a lot more about how we spend money than what new money we have to spend. But let's be honest. Let's also be honest about that, John. As you know, you know the military leadership looking out on the horizon now would relocate some of our military bases away <clears throat> from risky coastal areas in light of recent damage done to both Tyndall and Camp Lejeune, um, except that uh, there's too much congressional pressure to keep bases where they are today. And so, and without a base closure law, it's very hard to make yeah. these changes. So there's going to be politics around keeping installations in place despite growing climate and infrastructure risk uh, to to that to them. Yes, but it's one factor, right? So uh, yes, there's politics. They they rebuild they're rebuilding Tyndall. Um, could they have moved Tyndall? What did they really need it? Well the argument was they needed access to those ranges. Did they have to put every mission back there? No, they didn't have to put every mission back there. They could have made it leaner. They could have changed it more. And, and that's fine. Some of that's politics, but there are other factors that go into it. I'll give one example and get off the stage. Uh, the Reagan uh, test site at Kwajalein, um, they built a billion dollar radar out there and later found out that because of sea level rise, they're going to, n that island's not going to be uh, habitable by the 2030s. Why? Be not because it's underwater, but because the aquifer will be underwater. There won't be any drinking water there. Now, they can bring out, they can build a desal plant, they can bring out water, but those are decisions you want to make before you make your billion dollar investment. Those are things that you want to be able to take into account and then say, well, I need to build it there anyway. <clears throat> that might be the answer, but you need to have an informed decision process. Makes sense. A couple of questions for you from the, from the audience, Aaron. They're both process questions. One notes that lots of companies are out there analyzing data and so the question is, how much does the intelligence community and the NIC need to do its own independent analysis of that data? 
Uh, second question is, is related, and that is, uh, how does the NIC and intelligence reach out to NGOs in this area, many of whom are not, ex shall we say, not excited about working with either the government or intelligence? Do, you, does, do we need new forms of, of outreach? I was struck by this issue years ago when I was vice chair of the NIC. We were doing a uh, paper on humanitarian emergencies, and so we invited all the uh, humanitarian NGOs to come to a conference and bring a two-page paper. Well, they didn't much like the idea. Uh, they, we were sort of doubly damned, both government and intelligence. But in the end, uh, we were interested in their issue. Mm. And so they came, they all came and brought their two-page papers and in fact wrote the first draft of what didn't become a national intelligence assessment but became another paper. In any case, how do you think about um, both the need to and the options for outreach on this issue uh, given the institutional setting? Sure, no, those are good questions. I'll start with the latter. One, I think one of the great benefits of the Global Trends Project is it is completely unclassified. And you see the final report, it's all out there, there is no classified version. And so it allows for a lot of engagement, frankly, with audiences that the intelligence community wouldn't normally uh, engage with. And one of the things I really like about the project is we work to get out of Washington, D.C., right? And we work to get outside the Beltway and outside the think tanks, and we go to communities across the United States, but also globally, to talk to people to see how these trends are playing out on the ground where people actually live and work and breathe and spend their days. And so while it's a very data-driven project, it's also a very qualitative project uh, where we can see the William Gibson quote, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed and we wanna go do that. So we, we try to engage as much as possible with diverse audiences, recognizing that not everyone is comfortable always talking with us. Um, on the, the first question about uh, private sector and data, and absolutely. And I, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not proud necessarily to say we it has to be a government data. It has to be government analysis. We'll take good information uh, wherever we can get it. Um, and I think our our role is as a clearinghouse to a certain extent. Um, and as I said earlier, in partnership with the experts in government who really understand the modeling, really understand the science, so that we're getting getting the best information uh, possible. But you know, that's one of the trends we talk about in the report is the private sector has a huge role to play on a lot of issues on the global stage, uh, climate in particular. And that's something that we in the government need to make sure we understand how to engage uh, with them successfully. Great, thank you. Thank you. I was yeah, doing the last global trends. We, I think, uh, reached out to more than 2,000 people around the world and in 35 different countries. So it, it was a, a both a great uh, opportunity and I think a great demonstration of reaching out. This is a slightly technical question, perhaps more a, um, a DOD than intelligence community question, but it is, is the intelligence community factoring climate change into infrastructure resiliency models to drive resource allocation and operations? Dave, Sorry, think, John, do you want to take Yeah. Um, so, so the simple answer is that DOD is starting to take, uh, they've done a bunch of guidance to about how you adapt your base with climate. So so yes, there's a bunch of different things. There are uh, rules about building and floodplains now. There are handbooks out there. Both the Navy and the Army have installation uh, climate handbooks. The Army one just came out. Um, and in fact, the Army just came out with a, a new uh, climate uh, policy. So, so things are still happening. Guidance is still out there. And a lot of this stuff is being taken into account. Is everything being taken into account? Probably not, um, uh, uh, but there are a lot of good places where work is being done. You know, if I could just add one more thought, I think the place where there's the biggest deficit is in planning. They haven't done enough of the individual installation by installation vulnerability assessments to look at specific missions that might be vulnerable to specific impacts um, to figure out what they need to do to make themselves more resilient. A couple yeah. of questions about the Arctic. It, oh, good. Dave, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I would just say, yeah, I mean, sort of irrespective of, of the politics. I mean, in, you know, we hear this phrase in so many different areas of defense. You know, the facts on the ground ultimately win. And the facts on the ground are, you know, the seas are coming up and we're dealing with these hurricanes and, and water issues, either too much or too little. Uh, and I mean, the people in the DOD, they're not stupid. So they see these. And yes, it would have been nice to have done these things 10 to 15 years ago when most of the panelists were saying you need to do this. But eventually, 
uh, enough reality and, frankly, uh, enough congressional language in the National Defense Authorization Acts has been very supportive over the last, I would say, three or four plus years now, consistently supportive on both sides of the aisle. Uh, John John touched on that. So there's it, it's almost uh, now a, a mirror image of where we were, let's say, in the Obama administration, where you had an administration at the highest levels saying, press forward, do these things, and an implacably opposed Congress. And now you have an administration where you need to be, and I'm out of it, so I can say this, very careful on how you talk about this, especially publicly. But you have a Congress that increasingly, and you have to still be careful on how to talk about it, but increasingly is supportive of this, uh, not, and not only on uh, one side of the aisle. So so those dynamics are there. And I always tell people, you know, if I had to choose between having Congress or the administration supporting me, I'll always choose the Congress because uh, that will, frankly, lead to much longer term and more substantive change. Uh, so so, so many, these trends are happening. They're not happening maybe as quickly as I or John perhaps would like to see them. Uh, and there's certainly much to be done. Uh, but this is not a glass that is completely empty by any means. Well, so, let me just add on that at that point, if I could. I joined DOD after having served on the Senate Armed Services Committee, and I, I learned the hard way once I was in DOD that in many ways I had more power over my budget when I was on the Armed Services Committee than when I was executing it um, in DOD. But I will say that today, with congressional support, DOD is moving to update the uniform facility criteria that govern the infrastructure for defense facilities. And as those criteria get updated and then applied in specific infrastructure, installation, MILCON projects, that will make a difference in enabling the kind of decision making that John, for example, talked about on Quadrillant to take place uh, in advance rather than after the fact. But this is a multi-year process because, as you know, it takes many years to update uh, infrastructure, and that happens on a case-by-case -case basis. The Arctic has come up several times, and one of our colleagues observes that uh, the United States Coast Guard has only two icebreakers and asks the question, how will the opening of the Arctic sea route, how will that affect U.S. national security and trade? Well, we are absolutely undercapitalized in icebreakers. We have an icebreaker gap. Uh, <laughs> not only that, but our one of our two aging icebreakers had a fire aboard the Healy this summer, and so it had to cut short its annual mission. Um, and our icebreakers have to service also Antarctica as well as the Arctic because they provide breakout for the science mission down there. So we, there is a plan to ultimately build six new icebreakers um, and three medium um, and uh, in the near in the next say five plus years. But we're still in a gap uh, compared to Russia's almost 40 icebreakers, many of which are nuclear powered. Um, I mean, the Air Force recently released its its uh, first ever Arctic strategy, and clearly where it matters in the air and space, um, we continue to have the presence we need to deter missile and other threats, and we're increasing our presence throughout the Arctic in that, in that area. Uh, but we will in the future need to have more um, ability to operate at the surface, and that involves not only Coast Guard polar security cutters or upgraded icebreakers, but also the Navy's ability to operate. Um, and, and so naval forces are beginning to try to operate uh, in the in Arctic waters. And that's uh, a sea change, let's say, uh, for our, na for our uh, naval force, which hasn't had to be up there. Uh, and I was up at, uh, in Anchorage a couple of years ago for a... Uh, um, a NORTHCOM Arctic Maritime Symposium, and uh, to see our, our uh, uh, ships try to make it through uh, into the Anchorage port, which isn't even the Arctic, uh, where they hadn't been in a few years, was challenging. So much to uh, learn, and uh, uh, but there is a focus on that now, which I think is, is a good thing. The question is, is there going to be resources to support the investment we need? So, so Greg, if I could just leave sort of pile on here a little bit. So as I mentioned in my opening comments, the reason the Navy started Task Force Climate Change in 2009 was because of the changes in the Arctic. 
Uh, and you have to dig on the internet a little bit now, but there is a 2009 Arctic roadmap, completely unclassified, issued by the Navy, signed by the then Vice Chief of Naval Operations, John Greenert, who became CNO. Uh, it was updated in 2014, and much of what the Navy is starting to do now was described in there as far as what I told the, the Navy is, is you have to learn by doing. You know, you can't go to some book and figure out how to work in the Arctic, and it's a hard environment. And it's going to remain a hard environment to work in strategically. And I think this is where the intel community can really, really help along with some thoughtful, uh, I'll call them simulations in a public uh, environment here, uh, really works. You know, how do the dynamics between, let's say, a rising uh, China, uh, you know, Russia with its uh, challenges and U.S. and EU, how do those dynamics play out? as the trade routes potentially shift, at least seasonally, should they or should they not shift? I mean, we have, you know, commercial companies such as Maersk, I've been on many panels with Maersk who says, we're never gonna do the Arctic. And then I find out they're actually testing, sending container vessels up into the Arctic. Uh, they were loaded with frozen fish, maybe that's appropriate, I don't know. Uh, so, so we see the commercial sector, even if they're saying they're not going up there, they're going up there. Uh, how does this all play out? How do we look at those strategic parts? Uh, it was brought up, I think, in the very early comments about the uh, Northern Sea Route. Uh, I'm not all that worried about that because as the Arctic continues to change, you're going to open up the what I call the over the top route. Uh, and then what's going to be, I think, most strategic is, you know, places like Dutch Harbor, Deepwater Point, which is near the existing uh, Pacific shipping routes, trans-Pacific shipping routes, but also you then look at both the Faroes Islands and Iceland, uh, which can be a terminus and you can see potentially a bridge. The Finns for a number of years have been working on, frankly, uh, connector vessels that are what I would call ice capable. They're not ice breakers, but they would be ice capable. And we, we kind of focus a lot on, you know, how much ice is there. The even bigger change that's going on is how that ice is thinning. And as it gets thinner and thinner, you can build at an affordable cost ice capable vessels. So one of my many failures in the Navy was to uh, fail to convince the acquisition community and the requirements side back about a decade ago to start thinking about ice capable uh, naval vessels, not icebreakers. The Coast Guard can do that and that's their mission but ice capable so it's not a white knuckle operation, which it is right now for our commanding officers when they get up into that marginal ice zone. So I'll just leave it at that. I think it's gonna happen, but we could have done this in a deliberate fashion and we'll probably do it in a crisis instead. If I could just jump in uh, real sure. quick on, on the Arctic with, with two points, because I think it's a great example of the intersection of trends that I talked about earlier. And David referred to one already, the greater contestation we see in the global environment and the Arctic playing out against that backdrop. The other one I'll mention is a trend of what, what I call rising disequilibrium, a mismatch between the institutions that we have to govern how the world works and actual problems we're facing. And those two things aren't, aren't in, in uh, sync right now. And so you have a lot of uh, competition among actors to try and set the new rules of the game. And I think the Arctic is a place where you're going to see that play out more and more. And institutions like the Arctic Council might not be the best um, uh, things to, to manage, manage the new uh, challenges we're going to face there. So I think it, it exemplifies how, how these trends intersect. The Arctic is notable because it has been such a zone of, of effective cooperation. And so the question is, can that be preserved in dramatically changed climatological circumstances? That's, it's a very big issue. Here's the, what we would have called another period, the $24,000 question. And that is, uh, as we look forward and working on climate, we can't do it without China. Without the United States and China, uh, there's, there's gonna be no effective approach to uh, climate change. How do we do that? Well, are there strategies are some way to wall off pieces of places where we have to cooperate, like pandemics, like climate change, from this increasingly anti-Chinese mood that pervades Washington. Why don't, any thoughts on that? And then why don't we go around and if you have thoughts on that, uh, by all means, give them to us. But anything that you haven't been asked that you'd like to say, uh, should have been asked, say that too. We'll do this as a China question and as a wrap up. Sure. 
So, so, so the, sure. Okay. As the least knowledgeable person on this, I'll, I'll start and then everyone else can uh, say what the Admiral meant to say. Uh, and that's and that's fine. Uh, so what I would say is if I was looking at this, I would talk about this almost in the uh, in China's interest. So China, just like we talk about often our eastern seaboard and how sea level rise for various technical reasons is probably going to be greater than the world's average on our eastern seaboard. Uh, China has that same issue, too. They have places like Shanghai, you know, trillions of dollars. Uh, the engine of there. And, you know, and you start looking at the, uh, you know, the preservation of their own government. And they they sort of look at this, right? The will of the people. I mean, why does Beijing want to clean up their air? It's not because they've all of a sudden decided to hug trees. It's because the population had a real, real issue with this. So, you know, it's sort of that, uh, what's what's the phrase? You know, the, the manifest uh, destiny of their, of their, of, of their regimes there. Uh, and and so I would look at this as, you know, I would phrase it in sort of an almost a real politics term is this is in your interest, at least as much as ours, uh, arguably more so. I mean, if, if everything goes really hard south, I would argue the U.S. is in a better place than China if this goes really south. So I think, you know, we don't have to like them. We don't have to say we're not going to compete in many other places, but I would phrase it for there. The the right. only other thing I would do is kind of footstop on John's comment when he uh, talked about the national defense. And and I've had this when I've testified before Senator Cruz and others is, you know, rating, you know, th they try to get you to rank climate in, you know, some one to end type of order. And John is exactly right when he talked about how this affects everything. So sometimes not to be pedantic, but I talk about the difference of risks and threat. Climate is a risk and it affects everything. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, those can be threats. You know, those are people, they have capacity, and we think their people want to potentially do us harm, at least potentially. Uh, climate doesn't care. I tell people the ice doesn't care who's in office, it just melts. Uh, so there's not a there's not a people, I'm trying to do you bad component to this. It is just part of the world. We can make it worse or we can make it better. I would argue it's in our interest to lessen that risk, buy down that risk. Uh, and I used to refer to, ways to do threats it. So without, let me just stop there. Okay, great. As I, I used to refer to threats without threateners. Um, <laughs> no, one, no one means us harm. They just are trying to survive. John. So it, um, I'll try to be quick because I know we're almost out of time. I think, if you, I think if you look at China's behavior through a climate change lens, a lot, more, a lot of, of their activities make more sense. Why are they going and trying to take advantage of the resources in the Arctic? Why are they exerting influence over the fish supplies in the South China Sea? Why are they exerting influence over food supplying nations in, in Africa? They, they are finding ways to ensure they're going to continue to have food and water and influence the region because they recognize the facts of what is happening. Um, is a very self-interested point of view. They are continuing to emit twice of our twice our emissions, and we're not going to solve climate change without them reducing dramatically or us reducing dramatically. Let's assume nobody's going to reduce anything for a second. Um, you know, let's do two scenarios. Uh, first scenario, I'll go. I'll be optimistic. We all go to zero tomorrow. There's still 30 years of bad things that are going to happen because of right. stuff we already emitted. So you cannot plan forward in your intelligence assessments without assuming climate change is going to continue for a good 20, 30 years. Now, we're not changing that quickly. And so we're going to continue to have more problems through the rest of the century at the very least. Um, and, and so you just have to start to do your math, assuming things are going to happen and figure out how you're going to act in that environment. You, you, you can't get distracted by mitigation and think that's your whole strategy. It is not. Uh, adapting to what's really happening has to be front and center. Thank you. Sure. Last word. Okay. Well, uh, you know, ag agreeing with, with both my colleagues there, I think that if we look at it uh, from the Chinese homeland is more vulnerable in many ways to the growing climate risk because of its population, because of its vulnerable coastline, the Pearl River, Del Pearl River Delta is the engine of uh, manufacturing and export, and it's highly vulnerable to sea level rise uh, and storm surge. 
and they have water threats throughout the region of various types, floods and drought, uh, and they haven't planned their infrastructure to manage this yet. Uh, so I think that's, you know, they're going to, that's a risk that they face. But at the same time, since we can't solve the climate, you know, pro crisis alone, and we have to recognize a lot of this is baked in, as we move to low carbon energy sources, we can be selling some of our technology competitively into China, which is what we've been doing in many other domains over decades. So we shouldn't rule that out. You know, we're going to, we could be leaders in carbon capture and storage, and they're still very heavily coal dependent. Um, and in many other grid modernization, electrification technologies, we can't seed the field on solar, wind, or any carbon or, or any uh, clean energy technology to China. We need to compete. We need to compete globally and also to be selling into them at the same time. Aaron, one quick sentence. Uh, otherwise, we're out of time, unfortunately. No, I, I mean, you know, my colleagues spoke very well. And fortunately, in the Intel community, we just identify problems. We don't solve them. So okay. over over to policymakers on, on the China question. Well, let thank me you. say thank you to all of you for a really lively discussion and to INSA for putting this all together. Thank you. And thank you all out there for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to all our panelists for that thought-provoking conversation. We will now take a quick 15-minute break. We hope you will use that time to visit our virtual kiosks. The summit will start back up again promptly at 1.45 p.m. Eastern time for our closing plenary. We hope you will join us.